It's high noon in China's Gobi Desert. A battle is about to take place. An army of one of the largest gerbils on the planet is on the move. They're breeding like mad and chewing their way through almost everything in sight. In this high altitude desert, nomads have managed to eke out their survival for centuries. But their traditional way of life is under threat. Could these gerbils deal them a final blow by taking over from under? Chinese officials believe this rodent plague is one of the biggest challenges they may ever face. They're doing everything they can to stop it, even launching an assault team of natural-born predators. But there's no telling if the gerbils can ever be stopped. Xinjiang is China's largest province. It covers one-sixth of the entire country. The province is home to stunningly beautiful mountains, lakes, and wildlife. But nearly a quarter of Xinjiang is desert and it's an arid world of brutal extremes. Sub-zero winters only give way to scorching summer heat. Though the great gerbil has been part of this ecosystem for millions of years, here it's widely regarded as a pest. They are said to be spreading out like a vast army, eating their way through the grasslands, blade by blade nibble by nibble. According to Chinese officials, this method of attack has already damaged an area the size of Switzerland, and the gerbils are showing no signs of slowing down. One man who is fearful of the gerbils' advance is Nomad Akenbika. He and his family are herders. They are Cossacks, who, like their ancestors, have managed to survive in this harsh environment for centuries. For as long as he can remember, Akinbika has made the annual pilgrimage to these grasslands for his herds to feed. Every year from June to December, I'm at the summer grazing fields. We move twice every year. The camels move with us. Akenbika owns nearly 200 camels. To earn money for food and supplies, his family sells the camel's milk. Without this income, they would probably be forced off the land and into town. Akenbika is fighting so he and his family can continue living much as their ancestors have for centuries. That's why he needs to spend nearly every waking hour ensuring that his animals have enough food to survive. Every morning till night, I tend to my camels. The camels roam and graze throughout the day. Akenbika believes that if enough gerbils move in, he has good reason to be worried. The great gerbil is one of the largest species of its kind on the planet. In size alone, it puts its popular cousin to shame. A typical pet gerbil is usually about five inches in length. But the great gerbil, if conditions are right, can grow 16 inches long. And they're ravenous eaters.
Akenbika has seen firsthand just how bad the destruction can be. When the gerbils dig their burrows, they will destroy and eat the roots of the vegetation. The earth which the gerbils dig out also covers the grass and kills it that way. That is why in this area we have to try and get rid of the gerbils. A Chinese news program tracks the latest developments in what it calls the gerbil plague. This local report from Xinjiang TV takes viewers into the worst hit areas. It reports that desert grass has already been strangled by the rodents. Trapped gerbils are brought out for the news cameras. A few dying gerbils bring viewers face to face with the culprits. But these efforts don't solve the problem. The desert is just too large, and there are far too many gerbils to catch. Akinbika and his family keep a careful eye. Just yards away from their encampment, the gerbils are on the move. What will these rodents do next? And just how bad will their destruction be? In many parts of the world, animals can be some of man's worst enemies. In Africa, swarms of locusts descend on villages with little warning. Some swarms can eat 80,000 tons of vegetation a day. So much destruction means that millions of people could starve. Locust swarms are on the rise and have been reported recently on five continents. Other animals can also wreak havoc in numbers. Problems often arise when a new species is introduced, such as the case with the wild field mice in Australia. Changes in farming practices are thought to be the main trigger for these plagues. Now, there are reports of a new frontier in the battle against rodent hordes, Northwest China. Here, Grassland has already been destroyed by farming and herding, the result of feeding China's exploding human population. And Chinese officials are convinced that the great gerbils pose a dangerous threat to whatever grassland remains. One reason that great gerbils are so hard to control is that much of their activity takes place underground. A single gerbil returning to its burrow is actually entering a potentially vast underground world. Beneath the desert floor, gerbil tunnels can extend in virtually any direction. Each gerbil family constructs its own subterranean network. Tunnels serve as routes to chambers that are used for breeding, and storage of food. In gerbil groups, many family groups can be close together. When there are many family groups, the underground networks extend for kilometers. It's kind of like overlapping the subway systems of, say, Tokyo, New York, and London to create one giant subterranean world. In Xinjiang, that's just about what's happened with the gerbil colonies. We can't see their underground tunnels, but they're there, snaking across the region. An American researcher has come to Xinjiang to study the great gerbil colonies. Dr. Jan Randall is an expert on desert rodents. She's heard official reports about the great gerbil plague, and she's come to see it for herself. 
I look at them very differently from how uh, somebody would look at them who is, who's raising livestock here on the desert. For Jan, great gerbils are an essential part of the Gobi's delicate ecosystem. Their presence is uh, very important for the survival and, uh, of many other species in the desert community. You can see here all the different uh, tunnels, and these are uh, provide homes for lizards, for insects, for many other creatures that live in, in the desert. Jan knows that her passion isn't shared by everyone. People probably say, well, why would someone go, you know, halfway around the world to study these, these rodents that are considered pests by some people? But from a biological point of view, they're extremely interesting. They have an extremely interesting communication system. Jan is working on a study to understand how gerbils communicate danger. There are thousands of great gerbils in this part of Xinjiang. We may only spot one or two at a time, but each one is a member of a larger family and group. And Jan believes their social behavior can be a lifesaver. It seems that one of the main reasons these animals live together is because of their anti-predator behavior. For gerbils anywhere, the threat of predators from land and air can be relentless. A single gerbil living alone wouldn't have the benefit of the others to watch its back. It's much more likely to become someone else's meal. But working as a group, the great gerbils are much better equipped to outwit their opponents. And it's their anti-predator warning system that helps make this possible. Great Gerbil has an amazing warning system. They can uh, communicate uh, whether it's an aerial predator, uh, whether it's a predator approaching on the ground, and probably whether it's a predator that can go into the burrow or not. Jan will use a sophisticated seismic recording device called a geophone. Once in place, she's hoping it will allow her to hear the gerbil's coded signals. This is a small cylinder that was developed by geologists to record seismic vibrations. To many of us, a gerbil's behavior seems obvious, even much like our own. It snacks, does house repairs, grooms itself, and goes shopping. Sometimes, it looks like it's just hanging out with friends. But what's harder to understand is gerbil lingo. And that's what Jan is hoping to record. So I'm placing the, the geophone right there. And then I will go back to my recording equipment and wait for a gerbil to foot drum. Jan positions herself almost 10 meters away from the gerbil's burrow. Now she'll listen for sounds of something called foot drumming. A single gerbil's smallest sounds and movements can actually be signals to other members of the gerbil community. This one is sensing danger from a terrestrial predator. In response, it drums the ground with its feet. To humans, this can appear to be a subtle movement. But for gerbils, foot drumming creates small vibrations in the ground. Tiny seismic waves will transmit across the desert floor. They alert other members of the colony that a predator is near and warn them to duck for cover in time. Foot drumming is key to the great gerbil's defense system. And it doesn't take long for Jan's geophone to pick up the small vibrations. The sounds of foot drumming come through loud and clear. For Jan, these tiny audio waveforms are evidence that the great gerbil is a skilled communicator. What strikes me about desert rodents is that most of them live solitary. It's very unusual to have a really highly social desert rodent like the great gerbil. The great gerbil's communication skills help it fend off one of the desert's biggest threats, predators.
But that's not the only life-threatening danger that gerbils face. A desert can be a brutal world for any small mammal. And in China's Gobi Desert, the great gerbils are no exception. For them, getting enough food and water to survive can be a full-time job. And so much open ground can make it hard to escape predators. The Gobi is also an environment of potentially deadly extremes. In a given year, recorded temperatures have ranged from a staggering minus 43 degrees Celsius to a scorching high of 38. If a great gerbil stays out too long in this baking sun, it will heat stress and go into shock. But over millions of years, these rodents have found ways to survive, even thrive in this potential death zone. And the ground itself happens to be one of their best defenses. To escape the scorching sun, great gerbils retreat just beneath the desert floor. These relatively shallow tunnels can offer cool and instant relief. When winter comes, the burrows provide shelter from the cold. Once inside, they're well insulated from the frozen ground above. Cozy nests provide added warmth. Great gerbils just wouldn't survive without these subterranean retreats. But they still have to eat. And what makes the great gerbil a truly impressive desert survivor is its long-term planning. It's a renowned hoarder. During the warm season, a gerbil hunts and gathers food for the winter months. It shuttles in and out of its burrow to stock supplies. And that's because it's probably packing away a massive reserve of food. Food stores as large as one meter high and three meters across have been observed. When there is abundant food, great gerbils could easily bunker down for months if they had to. Just a few kilometers from the gerbil plague, the capital city, Urumqi, bustles with life. There's no sign of the gerbils in sight. For centuries, Urumqi has been an important outpost in the harsh desert. In former days, it served as a rest stop and trading center for travelers on the ancient Silk Road. But today, things are different. With a population of over one million, Urumqi is the largest city in western China. Highways, trains, and an airport have enabled the city to grow. Supplies are abundant. And there's plenty of entertainment for anyone who wants it. Urumqi's residents are a mix of Chinese, Russians, and Muslim tribals, including Kazakhs and Uzbeks. Many of them are former nomads and herders. For some, life in the city must be a welcome change from a hard day-to-day -day existence on the land. But others, had less of a choice. Their herds may have gone hungry, or the Chinese government encouraged them to give up their nomadic ways. Out in the desert, camel herder Akinbika is holding out. He and his family are struggling to continue living off their herds. But their survival requires a delicate balance of man, animal, and natural resources. 
and Akinbika is fearful that the invading gerbils may be upsetting that balance. The biggest threat to me on my farmland is the great gerbil. There are a great number of them and they eat up all the grassland, leaving nothing for my herd. Kazakh nomads rely on a complex set of survival tactics that have been passed down to them through generations. A horde of gerbils wouldn't be the first hardship that Akinbika and his family have faced, but it could be the final blow that forces them off the land. Luckily, help may not be far away. There's only one weapon in the nomad's traditional arsenal that could be useful to fight the gerbil plague. Kazakhs are masters in the art of falconry. Their skill in training golden eagles to hunt has made them famous the world over. By catching small game, the eagles have helped the nomads hunt for food. But can these highly efficient killers outsmart China's great gerbils? In China's westernmost province, Xinjiang, nomads still raise and train golden eagles to hunt. Just outside the village of Chirinxiang, a small group of falconers meets regularly to hone their eagle skills. Falconry is a family tradition. My father used to keep eagles. My children look after the animals in the farm while I train the eagle. Eagle trainer Malati Musa has already experienced the gerbil infestation firsthand. Last year, after the gerbils ate the crops, I lost 70 bags of corn, and about 30 sheep died because they didn't have enough to eat. For another of the falconers, Malati Sulatan, trained eagles can be an effective line of defense against unwelcome pests. I rear the eagle to protect the farm by having it cow the gerbils and hunting wolves that go after my sheep. A golden eagle's talons can be deadly, even for a human. The men have to handle their birds with extreme care. In these modern times, golden eagle hunting is more of a sport than a means of survival. But every winter, just across the border in Kazakhstan, an annual competition draws the best falconers from miles around. Eagle hunting is Kazakhstan's national sport. These falconers have already won regional contests and will now compete for the championship title. Under communist rule, hunting with eagles nearly died out. But now it's experiencing a revival, especially among Kazakh youth. Training a single bird to retrieve small game can take two full years. A man-made lure serves as artificial prey. The bird's owners are passionate. They'll even practice in driving snowstorms. The annual competition is any falconer's moment of glory. The falconers ride to the top of a nearby hill. They will launch their eagles one by one. 
On the ground below, small game is the eagle's target. Some eagles go straight for the kill. Others miss their targets. But their practice pays off. These eagles are highly trained, but they can still be unpredictable predators. Here, the term spectator sport can have a whole new meaning. On the snow below, a fox is the next target. A trainer sets his eagle on the hunt. The fox tries to make a quick escape, but the eagle is too expert a hunter, and its talons overwhelm the fox's self-defenses. The spectacular kill wins Tatanbek Umit Khan first place. But for him, the real prize is the eagle itself. Eagle hunting is part of our history. It is in the blood of all Kazakhs. I have three sons and one daughter. I love my daughter, but my eagle is even more dear to me. I cannot sleep at night without having taken care of my eagle. In competitions like this one, golden eagles are honored for their beauty, grace, and skill. They can also serve a very practical purpose. In one region of Xinjiang, great gerbils seem to be popping up everywhere. Could rallying golden eagles be one way to reduce the rodents' numbers? One man is hoping that golden eagles will be able to help solve China's gerbil plague. Sai Lao Kuichi Bai is head of rodent control for the province. His office bears witness to years of battling China's rodent pests. They hurt the society from many angles, in hygiene, in agriculture, in industry. Studies show that you can find more than 30 types of diseases on rodents. If they are not controlled, there will also be great losses in agriculture. Sai Lao has often relied on harsher methods to keep the gerbil population down. Before, we mainly used chemical poison. That was very effective and fast, but that also was harmful to the environment. China is not the only country to be searching for solutions to rodent plagues. Wherever they strike, they can be difficult to prevent and nearly impossible to stop. When millions of mice recently infested northern Australia, there was only one legal option to protect the crops, a poison called zinc phosphide. Crop dusters spread tons of it on fields. But poison is tricky because it can harm people as well as pests. Australian researchers have been working to come up with a more effective solution. They're trying to engineer a strain of herpes that can make mice infertile. But for now, better storage facilities, poisons and traps remain the tried and true methods. Back in China, poisons have also been used against gerbil infestations. This Chinese news report shows the different ways that poisons are used. From a temporary air base, planes loaded with bags of poison take off to treat affected areas. Inside, officials can keep track of the plague as it spreads and target their efforts to the worst hit areas. Down below, teams work the ground, placing the poison in burrows by hand. The problem with the poisons 
is that they can also be harmful to the nomads' herds, as well as other desert animals and plants. Sai Lao likes the idea that eagles offer a potentially natural solution. From the environmental point of view, it does not harm the environment and the health of the locals. But rallying a team of wild golden eagles isn't easy. First, he has to offer the birds incentives to stick around for the hunt. In areas being hit hard by the gerbil's advance, he places dozens of man-made eagle perches. Most are concrete, but some are built from stone. All offer eagles a convenient bird's eye view of their prey and a launching pad for their attacks. Throughout the region, signs notify residents that an experiment has begun. It's not long before golden eagles take advantage of the purchase. But they are far outnumbered by the great gerbils. And the government thinks the problem is getting worse. A great gerbil normally lives for only two to three years. But during its lifetime, it can reproduce at staggering rates. Underneath the desert floor is a massive breeding zone. There could be thousands of female gerbils in Xinjiang alone. Some can breed more than five times a year, with each litter containing up to 14 pups. That's close to 70 offspring every six months. If conditions are right, some females can breed again before their last litter is fully weaned. Every day, more hungry gerbils emerge from the nest. And they head out to compete with the nomads' herds for food. Without using heavy poisons, Chinese officials believe that the eagles could still be their best bet against the gerbils' population explosion. In the meantime, they're keeping track of the gerbils' movements. Field Officer Wu from Xinjiang's Rodent Control Department is sealing off burrows with dirt. He'll return to look for signs of activity and then take action. But Wu knows these traps alone could never solve the problem. He believes that eagles could provide a more permanent solution. The eagles are here every season. They can hunt the gerbils all year round. But even if the eagles arrive in large numbers, how many would it take to contain the gerbil plague? Are golden eagles hungry enough for the challenge? A single eagle in one week can consume nearly 50% of its body weight. But that's equivalent to only about 10 great gerbils, bones and all. It would take thousands of eagles eating nothing but gerbils every day just to begin to have an impact. And right now, there's no telling how many eagles will join the hunt. For China, the Great Gerbil Plague is only one front line in its war against an advancing desert. Each year, thousands of square kilometers of Chinese territory are turning into arid wasteland. And officials believe that the gerbils eating and tunneling are only making matters worse. Today, more than a quarter of China is now desert, and that percentage is increasing every year. In northern China, erosion is everywhere. Millions of rural Chinese have already been affected. Many have been forced to abandon their homes. The Gobi Desert is even threatening to overtake the country's capital, Beijing. 
The front line is less than 130 kilometers away. A major sandstorm now pounds the city at least once a month. Some researchers are predicting that Beijing will be unable to fend off this advancing great wall of sand. Most believe that China's desert emergency is the result of human activities. Years of overplowing, overgrazing, and deforestation, together with strong wind currents from Central Asia, have helped set this crisis in motion. But in their own corner of Xinjiang, officials believe that the great gerbils are threatening to make matters worse. One of the gerbils' favorite foods is an essential desert plant. Haloxylon looks like a simple desert shrub, but its root systems help hold the sand in place. The leaves feed the nomads' herds, while the branches are an important source of cooking fuel. The government believes the more haloxylon the gerbils eat, the greater the risk that the grassland will become wasteland. And if that happens, the nomads will have no choice but to give up and head for town. In the battle against the great gerbils, it would be easy to imagine that golden eagles have the clear advantage. They are top predators and master hunters. With eagles overhead, China's great gerbils have reason to be alert. One way they protect themselves is by living in groups and not venturing far from their burrows. The golden eagle is just the opposite. It's found on five continents. A solitary hunter, it travels for miles on its own. A massive wingspan of about two meters enables it to soar for hours as it scans for prey below. A great gerbil may be only a thirtieth of a golden eagle's size, but the eagle can probably spot it from up to two kilometers away. And compared to gerbils, golden eagles can lead lives of extreme speed. Even without batting their wings, these birds can ride warm air currents to spiral upwards at nearly the speed limit of a French highway. When it dives for a kill, it can go even faster. Some have been clocked rocketing to Earth at a staggering 300 kilometers per hour. When one of these lightning-fast predators gets a hold of its prey, its talons can rip it to pieces in seconds. They are simply built to destroy small game. Golden eagles may be well armed, with long-range vision, speed, and deadly gear, but great gerbils have an important advantage. They are bunkers. Once the gerbils are safely inside, golden eagles are helpless in the pursuit. And any attack must be quickly abandoned. Eagles would need their own bunker busters to get inside. And the gerbils use them constantly to their advantage. Rodent expert Jan Randall knows what the eagles are up against. She's doubtful that the experiment of using golden eagles to control the gerbil population will work. It's going to be a standoff. Eagles are good hunters, they have great eyesight, but obviously the gerbils have this very good warning system and defense system from, from millions of years of evolution with predators. But Sai Lawu remains optimistic that these birds of prey will succeed. To completely eradicate the rodents is not possible, but they can definitely be controlled. Out in the desert, the golden eagles seem to be getting ready to hunt the great gerbils. It's exactly what Sai Lao has been hoping for. 
but he's not sure if they'll be able to stop the gerbil advance. In China's Gobi Desert, it's time for a showdown. It's even been known to take on deadly snakes without mercy. Who would dare battle such a beast? Or at least try and outsmart it? Enter China's great gerbils. Soft and furry, they're seemingly harmless. Small twitching nose and furious chewing may be cute to many of us. But those who live here in the desert see a nastier side. These camels are crossing what looks like a rodent minefield. In this part of the desert alone, there are great gerbil nests everywhere. The nomads are worried their herds will no longer get their share of the desert plants. But just try and catch one of these rascals. It'll probably outrun and outsmart you nearly every time. That's where lightning-fast eagles come in. If they can't deal the gerbils a blow, what can? Chinese officials are anxious to find out. Golden eagles are already using the man-made perches to keep a watchful eye on potential prey. Some prefer flight. Others sneaking up on the ground. But China's great gerbils are sensing danger. Death may come from above. They're signaling to others that predators are near. One eagle, undeterred, attempts to make a kill. But its target is already running for cover. And outruns its opponent just in the nick of time. The eagle has no choice but to abandon its attack. Golden eagles are skilled hunters. But they still only nail their prey 30% of the time. The great gerbil's anti-predator defenses can be tough to outmatch, even for these swift predators. But when golden eagles do succeed, they kill with brutal force. One gerbil is foraging and has strayed too far from its burrow. An eagle seizes the opportunity. The hunt is on. And the eagle catches his dinner. But it's only one gerbil among thousands. The battle of golden eagles and great gerbils carries on throughout Xinjiang. The eagles eat their fill of gerbil meat. But in the end, the gerbils prove worthy opponents. Even if the eagles were to feast on gerbils every day, it's not clear whether they'd reduce gerbil numbers significantly. may take much more than a squadron of eagles to tackle China's great gerbil problem. In the end, the Chinese government will continue using a combination of techniques. And for rodent control on this scale, poisons remain the fastest and most effective option.
Tsailao thinks the experiment was worthwhile. He remains hopeful that his department can find more ecological ways to stop future plagues. We will continue to research other effective methods based on technological advances in this field, and we will work with experts in other countries as well. For Nomad Akunbika, the eagles may have helped, but they didn't remove the threat. The gerbils and the camels are still competing for the same food. Akinbika and other nomads have been called on to help control the gerbil infestation. What a trip in the mind. Every nomad will get the poison and apply it on the land himself. As night falls in the desert, one of the perches stands empty. Around Akanbika's camp, there are no eagles to be seen. But underneath the desert, the gerbils are holding out. And they are starting to breed again. <laughs>